morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are <clears throat> back from Richmond live. I'm Jackie Glass, Mama, Navy Vet, Certified Doer, and your Laced Up Legislative Slater for the House of Delegates 89th District. Ah, that was a mouthful. Um, first off, yeah, good morning again and again and again. We made it another day. Um, really, really, again, every time I come back, every time I get back from Richmond, I do feel a debt of gratitude to, or a sense of gratitude for, um, for what it is that we are able to do. Um, as promised, part of what needs to happen today is I said, hey, we're gonna take and um, break down um, our budget a bit, <laughs> which is a big deal, good morning. So as we break down the budget conference reports, and, and for those of you, you can drop it in the chat if I need to explain conference reports, I'm so okay with that. That's, well, let me just say it, that's what we're making compromise on the, the different budgets between the House and, um, and the Senate. And that is what we went up there to do yesterday. Uh, so if you have questions about the budget, please drop them in the chat. What I'm gonna do for you all, um, just as a, as a resource, is I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put uh, uh, the Commonwealth, um, Institute's side-by-side uh, -side comparison of the budget between what the Senate introduced, what the House introduced, and what um, what actually came out of conference. Um, what actually came out of conference yesterday. That's really important just to see what was proposed uh, on both sides and then what we actually agreed on. Um, thank you so much uh, <laughs> for the good jobs. Thank you so much for the good mornings. Yesterday was a pretty smooth day. Um, in the in the Democratic caucus, we elected new leadership. Uh, we now have a new minority leader because the Democrats are in the minority in the House. Our minority leader um, just happens to be from the Hampton Roads area. So I think we're really, I think Hampton Roads folks may be really excited about that. That should be um, Delegate Don Scott. But we also have our chair, uh, Charnel Herring, who is from the Northern Virginia area. I think that is an amazing balance of having uh, folks from across the Commonwealth represent us, and we're looking forward to doing some great things. Oh, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> thank you, so I'll, I'll start with that. I'll start with, I see the comments about um, my speech yesterday. Um, what I will say is um, oftentimes in these conference reports, uh, the compromise that is made uh, doesn't necessarily uh, get us to where we want to be, but it gets us somewhere. And in particular, um, um, in particular, there was a bill, uh, our conference report that revolved around uh, military retirement. And most of the compromises, or we do a lot of compromises anyway um, within the budget, but that particular report sort of struck a nerve with me uh, because what it was actually doing was making it so that the, re the, the, the tax relief that folks get on their military retirement um, had an age limit of 55. And um, I kind of wanted to, and if you, I just, we posted the video the other day um, um, for everyone to see um, just that little piece of thing. It, it, it's an unfortunate truth that like, from what I, it's unfortunate truth that oftentimes when you can't see people, you're not able to advocate for them, which is why we do this, which is why I lean into all the folks around me to help me see constituents that I might not necessarily be able to see. And I just saw a good morning from Patricia. Patricia is a, is a constituent that keeps me, like if there's an issue in the Hispanic community, she's not the only point of contact, but she's definitely the one that's like, yo, here is what's happening. So when you can't see people, oftentimes you may fail to be of service. And this particular bill failed to be of service to the vast majority of retirees. We said we were going to compete. We said we were going to do a better job at uh, taxing military retirement. Um, and it put an age limit of 55. And quite frankly, many 
military folks are retiring in their late 30s, early 40s, and if they're officers, they're retiring pretty much in their mid to mid to late 40s. It's unacceptable to provide a tax break to the top 10% of folks that retire, right? Like, <laughs> it's it's it, it gives it actually gives what it what it does is it it would have been very helpful to flag officers to very very senior 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 enlisted like but it doesn't do so yes i voted against the bill i did not necessarily want to vote but i realized if there's a principle in this is that um we can't we can't keep telling people thank you for your service and then pretending like pretending like we're actually doing something for them when we're not so i felt very strongly about it strong enough to vote against it but even though I vote against it, I will tell you, I did reach out immediately on my drive home from Richmond to the governor's office, policy office, and I told them, hey, look, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way. The governor still gets to make recommendations. So like, like with all the things we have next week, we'll be back in Richmond. The governor has this time to make his recommendations on all of the conference reports, and then we go back and we'll have to vote on them on the 17th. So while I was in Richmond today, I have to go back on the 17th and will vote on what what the govern the, the governor's amendments and so i ask him to consider lowering the ceiling meaning like not making so much money tax um so instead of saying up to forty thousand we can say up to twenty thousand but get rid of the age requirement because if you're making forty thousand dollars as a retirement check well, let me tell you like that's a full-time job for people <laughs> to just like i just yeah so i do believe in in equity and i do believe in seeing people who for who they are all right so thank you for that that videos online um for all to see but I would like to like I said if you have questions about the budget or anything in specific anything in particular about the budget please put it in the chat um, um, so that I can um, do a, hopefully a good job at answering your question here's what's super important right uh, and I want to give a shout out to the delegates that are working really hard and have worked really hard to make some of these things happen um, so the budget has some very real life, and I got my notes here, <laughs> so that you guys know, um, relief for Virginia working families. For the first time, there's going to be an earned income tax credit, earned income tax, excuse me, earned income tax credit will be refundable, right? Like it's going to establish another rule, another obligation, another opportunity for, uh, tax relief, which is killing people right now. <laughs> between how much things cost and how much are like taxes are killing people and especially when, at the beginning of the month I'm gonna let the car pass I didn't want to be in the um, I didn't want to be in the office today so we're we're out here um, so that is a piece really really excited about the earned income tax credit and we can say shout out to delegate Marcia Price who was one that did it in a, a if you Get a chance you can go to her page a phenomenal floor speech just on why this matters for working people and working families like that is who we should be really honing in on right now and supporting so it's really good to get that in the budget as you all know that the the state grocery tax good morning uh the state grocery tax was um eliminated uh while ensuring uh, schools and localities don't face cuts that's important so the way i explain it at least i think we all have to understand taxes better is that if we tax this water bottle in order to pay the phone bill right right we're taxing the water bottle so that we can pay the phone bill um and we decide we're going to tax this water bottle less which means we have less to pay for our phone bill which means we might have some service interruptions so we have to consider when we take money, when we tax things less, what they pay for. And so grocery tax was one of those things that paid for some schooling, uh, schooling items, right? So like taking, lowering taxes on this may mean, to pay the phone bill may mean now we need to go ahead and, and, and start taxing paper, which we didn't use to tax or increase the tax on paper, right? Like. It is not just a lower taxes and everything's going to be all good. That money got to come from somewhere to pay for the things like transportation, like schools, right? Like, I just want folks to keep that in mind. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate it. We try. We try. Um, and they're going to send direct uh, relief through tax rebates. That'll start early this fall. So be on the lookout, right? Direct relief through tax rebates. So that that's those are some pluses as far as economic relief. 
that's something that's really important. School funding there is touted as an historic level of funding for public school. That's something that um, that we've been excited about on this side about just really everyone says fully fund our schools. I'm still wondering what that means. Like <laughs> what is fully fund? We're trying we need to fund, fund them better, fund them to the best of our abilities. Um, so there is more than one billion dollars of new funding for school construction. Um, and up to 10% uh, teacher raises and another thousand um, bonus for teachers each year. Shout out, right? Like that's something we're, we're, that's really important. Um, and that, that came through some really good leadership that we've had over the past couple of years. We had a, a crazy good surplus, granted, keeping in mind that COVID is a part of that piece, but, but um, this this funding is going to allow schools to hire new staff support staff that's a piece you know reading specialists and if you take a look if you didn't get a chance i'm going to put it in here uh the budget comparison um the budget breakdown side by side so that you can see how much how much uh, um, is being spent and where. I'm putting it in the chat again, right? Because I think it's super important for us to, when you guys are knowledgeable, you can do a better job at holding me accountable. Um, so um, yeah, and it's gonna make sure that there's a full-time principal, full-time principal in every school. I, I know some of you I know that might not know that like some schools don't have a full-time principal. That's real, that's a reality in some spaces. Um, so, so school funding, right? So if you get a chance to go to the Commonwealth Institute's breakdown and, and get to see exactly how much that shift, um, I think some of that you can be, we can be really proud of. And like I said on Tuesday, in a budget, there will be things that I really love, there will be things that I really hate, uh, but there's a hard decision to make. Do I wanna fund the, really, uh, the, the things I really love and, and swallow the things I really hate? Or um, do I wanna say no to the, things I really love just and and things still go by right like that is the tough decision so I ask for you all's grace as we as legislators you know vote on these things and don't always 100% agree with what's happening um, some additional priorities that are in the budget uh, that actually this side of the aisle has worked on for like the past two years um, and continues to ask for increases which is a good thing uh, mental health so it's gonna find there is uh, money to fully fund the step VA program so it's gonna you'll be able to have staff pay raises crisis support system uh, and it creates this uh, permanent support of housing uh, to give people uh, with serious serious mental illness access to stable housing that's a huge piece y'all um, also in early childhood education there's gonna be uh, they're putting additional funds into the Virginia preschool initiative right because it's not daycare it's early childhood learning um, and then expanding some access to three-year-olds um, and create some workforce uh, workforce recruitment initiatives because we don't have enough folks right like we don't have enough folks getting in the field to, to do what we need to do um, um, housing so we're continuing to invest um, in housing you guys know that I think uh, the JLARC put out a report that talked very very heavily about the Virginia Housing Trust and uh, what it is, what it is, what it ain't. I mean, not the Virginia Housing Trust. It talked about uh, housing, the housing need in the Commonwealth. And I think we're over 200,000 houses short, homes short. Um, so we've got a real issue here. Um, so right now the, the Commonwealth is gonna put an additional or, or towards affordable housing uh, programs. There's gonna be up to 150 million for the uh, Housing Trust, the Virginia Housing Trust, and raising the cap to 60 million for the Virginia Housing Opportunity Grant. Yep, JLARC. So there was a JLARC study, a J joint legislative and uh, review. Let me make sure I'm um, saying JLARC right. And I'll explain that, Jay, thank you for asking. So if I ever 
Um, if I ever say something that you're like, what the heck are you talking about? Please make me um, explain it to you. Put it in chat. So the joint, JLARC is the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission. Oftentimes what JLARC is, is charged with is if we have something that we're questioning or need more information about or there's a study that's needed, the JLARC actually comes together nonpartisan and they create that report. They do that research. Source. They do that research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the the link to the JLARC uh, um, to to the JLARC in the chat and on the first page you'll see the recent reports that they've done so they've done an affordable housing in Virginia report they've done a Virginia juvenile justice system report uh, Virginia Employment Commission yo because the VEC yo <laughs> like <laughs> God um, and then transportation and inf in infrastructure and, and funding. So I'm gonna put that in the chat for your for all my um, for my research and knowing what you don't know, folks. Uh, it is a great resource. Yeah, it's a lot of the reason we were able to sort of look at the breakdown with the casino stuff here is the J Lock did a report on on casino and gaming. In, in the Commonwealth and gave us a lot of stats on what works, what doesn't work, and what they see based off of, of data. So it is data-driven, uh, facts-based uh, research, non nonpartisan. okay? So in that JLOC report, you can see the affordable housing report that they did in the Commonwealth. And unfortunately, Norfolk is mentioned in there because we have such a high eviction rate. Uh, that is something that is, <laughs> I really, um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do some, we got some policy brewing uh, for next year to really help mitigate uh, evictions here because it's such a, it's such a tough issue. It's, it's, it, it, it is, it is a, it is indicative of a system, right? Of a necessarily a court system that is failing tenants um, in some of, sometimes the most ridiculous ways and we've got work to do on that. I'm trying to bust through. I'm, I'm going to get as much as I can in before our time is up. So we, uh, public safety, so we're ensuring that police officers are given that much needed pay raise. I told you I will always hold in my hand educators and police officers. They have a much needed pay raise that they're going to get to sheriff deputies and other law enforcement. Um, and there's additional funding for local police departments for training and equipment. So I say that. And also recognize that it's a yes and, right? Not only do we train and equip, um, but we also uh, we also invest and care for communities in the same vein, right? Uh, water quality, which may not be that interesting to you, it's it's a priority here. I don't know, y'all. Water is a hot thing, uh, so there's some major water quality projects that'll be coming up. And I don't know if y'all know this, but Norfolk got really great water just saying it's it's been it's it's been uh it's been on a list for some of the best water <laughs> we do we have great water straight from straight from the tap we we do it well all right so as i said some of the things that are positive um let me just point out some things that are items of concern right that is actually concerning for us number one it's this lab school piece like um, we've seen the lab school experiment before and it did not work very well um, and right now there has been a push for these lab schools but not necessarily a reason of explaining why these outcomes will be different come second around um, one of my colleagues that um, shares different values than I do uh, was said you know a charter school lab school call it don't care what you call it calling it what it is I just do not want another program that is going to hinder our ability to do public school education right yes like that that's it or to fund it in a way where we're not funding opportunities but we're funding solutions so right now they're spending over a hundred million dollars on um, this lab school thing and there's a real need I just think about where that hundred million dollars could be going in our public school systems rather than um, building out this lab school program without without saying how it's going to be different um, oftentimes they make us study things before they do them I just don't see where we're um, showing or saying how it's going to be different now many universities are um, on board these are laboratory schools so they often lived inside of universities they're like a working a classroom classroom <laughs> a lab classroom where educators where their students and educators that are learning and growing and and, and things like that 
um, it's important that we have innovation and partnerships. I think no one dis disagrees with that, uh, but I just don't know that lab schools is that innovation and innovation and partnerships that we're looking for. Um, it it's it's a challenge, right? Um, gun violence prevention, and again, I'm going to give another shout out to Delegate Price for really her floor speech. Um, if she shares it, I'll make sure I share it with you guys, especially for our communities that are facing maybe violent crime isn't going up, but gun violence is, right? Like, you know, after everything that we've seen in the past couple months, um, it's it's disappointing. Uh, the gun, um, the gun violence prevention efforts that we made at this step, state level. I think that you know, like it's our budget is our values, um, and our values are that of the Commonwealth, which are varied. We hold that in our hands, we honor and respect it. But I think everyone in the Commonwealth can see that that across our nation, there's a real concern about gun violence prevention, and uh, we are super grateful for. Um, folks in the Senate side with shared values uh, for gaining back $8 million to create the, the firearm um, and violence uh, intervention and the prevention uh, grant fund that we've been talking about, you guys. We've been sort of talking at this. Uh, but that amount falls significantly short from the $22 million that was asked for to invest in, in preventative measures. So really concerned, but also like feel like that's a huge shortfall, short shortfall. Um, and then lastly, with housing, like yeah, yeah, there is. We definitely have had some increase in funding on affordable housing. Good morning. Uh, but we definitely have are making up. Like we've got a long way to go. <laughs> Like it's it's we're we're coming from behind, right? And saying we're doing a good job, but really we're way behind. You can't have somebody two laps ahead of you gain a half a lap and be like, yeah, I could win this. No, 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 no. We got to do what we have to do to get a whole lap in or more, and it requires investment. And so uh, that is where we're sitting with the housing efforts. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. However, again, it falls, this budget falls short of getting us actually what we need. And I think everyone is going to be working really hard next year to make sure that, uh, that one, we get more funding. Um, two, we get the people in place whose values are aligned with the things we just talked about. And that's what it boils down to, you guys. Like, I, I hate to, no, I don't hate to, I just have to say this, right, is um, right now our shared value side is in the minority. And there are some people in the majority that share, that share values, um, but not enough, not enough to push the needle the way I think many of the people in the Commonwealth want to. So it's going to be next year, whenever they decide to have us run, it's going to be a tough year. Uh, but I think we're going to make it easier by um, by getting really great people elected. And it starts right in your own backyard, wherever you are, because I know there are folks in other places um, um, doing great things. Hold on a second. All right. So uh, can you speak on the funding? Uh, if funding was passed for casinos in Virginia. Um, we don't necessarily pass funding for casinos. We, um, um, and I'm gonna get ready to wrap up. And, and I know I started a little bit late, so I'll take questions. I'll, if you got questions, I'll take questions for another, uh, another five minutes. Uh, because I know I started about six, six or seven minutes late, but if you got questions, put them in the chat, make sure that we, um, so that I can answer them. So to your question, um, we don't fund casinos. The, we license them as a state. Um, we regulate them as a state and we tax them. Um, so what we look at is what we do with the casino tax money on the things that we tax them on. So uh, part of that casino money is going to education. I call it right now imaginary money because um, it doesn't exist. So we are funding our schools and, and touting uh, amazing gains in education with imaginary money because these casinos have to be built. Um, if you're looking for information on casino 
funding. Um, it would depend on your locality. I know you're in Petersburg, and I can't remember the outcome of you all trying to get a, a, a casino there, but uh, Chioma, you are always more than welcome to drop me a line so that I can get you um, the whatever information it is that you need to the best of my ability. All right, three more minutes. Do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, so lack of housing, mental resources, living wage, job can make a real difference. Yeah, I agree. So part of, and I'll go back to the, the veteran piece, is like what I think we have to understand as we try to take care of people, you know, subsets, whether it's, um, whether it is uh, quality of life, I mean, excuse me, whether it's taxing or, or, or whatever. The reason why people choose to be in a specific place or space or why they want the ability to choose is they're looking at several things. How much does it cost for me to live there? Is there affordable housing? If they have kids, is there childcare? Are groceries high? How much are my utilities gonna be? Do I have access to healthcare? It's all quality of life. Like all of this is about quality of life. And I know that we aren't leading on these things. Um, um, all, all, we're not leading on all of these things or, or, or any of them to be quite frankly as a commonwealth. And so in order to get there, like I said, we've got to have people in place that believe that we put the dollars and cents behind these things, right? Like we have this crazy, I mean, if you guys check out the news, you will see that we have been talking about this phenomenal surplus that we have this amazing surplus that we have. Yo, what are we doing with it, right? And that's, that's the truth. What are we doing with the surplus, right? Are we spending it in a way that we are improving the quality of life of Virginians while still taking care of business? Because bills got to be paid. You want your potholes fixed. You want your schools better. You know what I'm saying? So, and all of that rolls back into quality of life. But I think we all have to do a better job of making this make sense for folks like you all so that you can do a better job at holding us accountable. Yeah, that is awesome. You have that vet set, yep, that's true. So Northern Virginia uh, is gonna have a vet hospital coming um, in October. Uh, so we'll see, we see these things are happening. There are good things happening. Um, and I think we'll always be in a space where we want more or we want different because we are a constitutional democratic republic. We have so many different uh, values at the table, but what hasn't happened y'all is we haven't stopped working. And that is the beauty of this republic is that uh, yes, people did storm the, storm the Capitol uh, and try to challenge, uh, but this government is still operational. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna give it a minute because I did say five minutes uh, because I was on a little bit late. So um, I will say this again. Um, I, it is an honor and a blessing to serve. I am grateful. I hope that this Thursday is a phenomenal one for you. There's a lot of things happening this Friday. Um, I just got the message about the Stop the Violence program happening at, on, um, at the Croc Center. Fuse Fest is happening at Purpose Park. Um, shout out to Tawana Golson, who's having her Women in Business Conference out in the Williamsburg area this weekend. So many good things for you all to get into, so many opportunities, and I hope that you make the most of it. So until Tuesday, or if anything happens in between there, I'm Jackie Glass, Mama, Navy Vet, Certified Doer, your Laced Up Legislator for the House Delegates at 89th District. Um, I hope you guys are able to make it a great weekend. Take care.